Hey, Nat. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hello there. It's a pleasure being here, I think, if I could dodge the machete. <laughs> After all this time, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, get a chance to talk to you today. How are you? Thank you, Aaron. Good, Aaron. Thanks very much. It's been a kind of a whirlwind around here, but the book seems to be doing well. And with the actual 50th anniversary of The Exorcist coming up being so important, and of course, the loss of William Friedkin a couple of weeks ago as we record this, um, it's been quite a quite a storm. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of crazy the way all that's happened. Was this uh, when you dove into the idea of doing this book? Was the idea with the 50th anniversary always a thing or does it just so happen that way? Very much with the idea of the 50th anniversary coming up. That's what inspired the book. My new agent, whose name was Lee Sobel, had a fix on publishers by saying that they always seem to like round numbers to put out their books, 25th anniversary, 40th anniversary, or 50th anniversary. And immediately both of us at the same time said, well, The Exorcist. And he sold it within about four days. So I guess the publishers were on board with it too. Um, before we maybe backtrack a little bit, uh, just to kind of continue that that talk about the 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 Exorcist book, um, how how difficult or maybe how easy is it to put together something like that? I feel like the the IP of the Exorcist seems like such a big thing, and you would imagine that uh, the market would be flooded with material on something like this. But in the past few weeks, it seems that. Uh, your book is now kind of being seen as like the, I guess, the Bible on this. <laughs> That's an unusual choice of words, I would think. Um, uh, well, it, it is kind of like the elephant stepping into the waiting pool, I suppose. Uh, I, I think a lot of people had written about The Exorcist over the years, but I had a certain leg up in that first, in 1990, I had published the biography of William Friedkin, who directed The Exorcist. And so I had all of my notes from those days, including some interviews with William Peter Blatty, who had written the novel of The Exorcist that I had held from publication as a courtesy to Bill while he was still alive. So there was new information that came out that was actually old information. In addition, I was... I've been possessed by The Exorcist, if you will, for half a century, because the day before it opened in 1973, it opened on Boxing Day in 1973 in 22 theaters in America. But the day before, we were given permission to screen it, because I was a publicist at the time, for the press. Now, if you well know, the day before Boxing Day is Christmas Day, and so you can imagine all of the critics who happened to be in Boston, Massachusetts, showing up to a private screening of The Exorcist, being torn away from the bosom of their family on Christmas morning. And I'm sure none of them objected. I was the publicist for that particular showing, but I was stationed outside the theater, keeping people who weren't invited from coming in. So I really have been involved in kind of carrying water, if you will, for The Exorcist for 50 years. And it was just a natural thing to be able to write about it from a personal as well as historical experience. And in addition to the original Exorcist, I also wrote about the other Exorci, such as The Heretic, Exorcist Three, and the prequels and sequels, including the new one that's coming out. That's got to be quite a full circle moment, right? It was very personal. And especially with losing Billy, it made it in intensely personal, uh, almost as if I had to complete the mission as uh, as an honor to him. And since, uh, you know, in the past few weeks since uh, it's come out, what's the reception been like for you? Um, uh, you know, aside from publishers or agents or anything like, but just for you personally, uh, from feedback you've gotten or maybe fans or different people who've read it that have reached out? <laughs> The strangest thing has happened since the book came out and appears to be selling well. I'm suddenly getting my phone calls returned. Now, it sounds like a small thing, but in, 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 in Hollywood protocol, that's, that's quite something. I, I've written, this is my 28th book, and a lot of my books were so obscure, it seems they were originally published as remainders. But in fact, this one seems to be the one that does the job. So I guess in another 28 books, maybe I'll have another hit. How does that, uh, to, I guess, to, to continue on that topic, um, you know, the idea of putting together a book and then, like you said, to to write 28 books like that and then, you know, obviously, uh, satirically, you, you only have a hit now, but to kind of keep that, um, 
that train rolling like uh, like i said there there's some of the titles i guess that would be seen as a maybe more of a, a cult following and people who are really interested in it are like really really interested but how do you keep i guess that that train rolling over the course of you know 20 odd books every now and then i'd have a hit the biography of science fiction or rather speculative fiction writer harlan ellison came out a few years ago and that sold extremely well within the genre of uh science fantasy, science fiction, and speculative fiction. I had written at the beginning, way at the beginning, a book on etiquette, on manner, and that sold extremely well for the publisher. And so you could say, I've, I've written the book on good taste. I've done these books over the years, and none has, been a, none has been a failure. There's one on the Towering Inferno, which is geared to next year's 50th anniversary of the Towering Inferno, and that's from an independent publisher named Bear Manor Media, and it, it is doing well already. And I'm just wallowing, I suppose, in, in this, but I'm also aware that, as, as uh, the line is at the end of the movie Patton, that all fame is fleeting. You mentioned uh, the Towering Inferno and Bear Manor Media, actually, and I think they've been quite clever in some of the things they've acquired over the last couple of years. They're a very direct. Uh, the books are made for a specific audience, and they are generally seem to have, like, you know, a mass cult following and diehard fans. Um, when you're deciding on a, on a project, because it's, it's such a vast, over the course of 20, 28 titles, it's such a vast kind of range, you know, like you would think from The Exorcist to The Towering Inferno, in a way they couldn't be further apart, but then they kind of feel like a similar style. Bear Manor, the owner of Bear Manor, Ben Omart, is, has become a friend of mine over the past 15 or so years. And I, I so appreciate the support he gives. They have a wonderful designer by the name of Robbie Atkins, whom I've used. It's like a family in a way, even though because it's an online corporation, we're all spread all over the United States. Uh, I, I enjoy writing for Ben. And if I have something that I think is suitable for his particular audience, which is popular culture, entertainment, you know, cinema, uh, radio, like that, then I'll, I'll ask if Ben is interested in publishing it. He's also indulged me into publishing two of my memoirs, one of which is Screensaver, which is pictured on the, on the composite you have. Uh, Screensaver was my memoir of being a publicist, dealing with famous people. So it's really about the famous people, not about me. And it's the stories I've been telling at cocktail parties for the past couple of years, and now I can put them in print, and I can forget the stories and work on new material. So when you're writing a lot of books, you, just, you, you write something that you want to write, and if you're lucky, you can sell it. With Bear Manor, we seem to be in sync. Ben and I have a certain mindset that seems to work for both of us. With other books, such as the Exorcist book or the Scarface book or the one I'm working on now that I can't discuss, I have an agent who is able to take it to publishers and let them know two years in advance that something will be coming. It's, it's hellish. And publishers are becoming more like film companies, which is sort of like high school with money. <laughs> And for you personally, then, how do you decide? Is it, is it a case of what interests you particularly? Or is it if something, you know, maybe just comes across your path and you're like, hi, oh, you know, that might be interesting to dive into and you just go from there? It, it varies, Aaron. It really does. If, if something interests me, I'll write it, even if I don't have a, a contract or a, a sale. I'm, I'm working on a, another book now that I want to write, and I'll see how many words I can get before I lose interest. But otherwise, you know, I have a dog to feed. I have to feed myself. I have to do laundry. And so I, I have to sell books no matter what happens. And it's, sometimes it's a job of work. But I've been doing it long enough that I can find something of interest in anything I do. Uh, oh, my God, I sound like Mary Poppins. <laughs> is there is there something that's on your uh, i guess bucket list that you would love to work on whether it be an ip a filmmaker uh, anybody uh, or any material in particular that's eluded you thus far yes and it'll never be done i would like to write a book on biographical or autobiographical films i mean the most recent one we have is the Fablemans from spielberg but i'd like to compare the actual lives of filmmakers with the films they've made that are autobiographical. There was a wonderful writer director who was a close friend of mine named James Bridges, who made Urban Cowboy and the China Syndrome. And he made a film which is fairly obscure called September 30, 1955, which the title is drawn from the date that James Dean was killed in a car crash. 
And it's about what happens to a bunch of kids in a small town in Arkansas on the date that James Dean dies. It's one of the few films ever to talk about the hold that movie stars have on their fan base. And it's autobiographical for, for Jim. And I wish I could write a, a comparison between his life and his film and a lot of other autobiographical films out there. Uh, that, but no one is interested. No one is interested. I tried pitching it. If anybody else wants to take the ball and run with it, more power to you. Hmm, interesting. Um, has there ever been something in the back of your mind, let's say if we narrow it down a bit more, a uh, particular film or anything like that, that you would love to cover in depth like you've done with, you know, the likes of The Towering Inferno or The Exorcist that you feel maybe hasn't been done justice so far? You sound, you, you sound like my agent. The, <laughs> you're, Aaron, the questions you're asking me are, are the questions that would be asked by somebody who wants to write a book of his own. Are you thinking about writing something? Is there a film that you think will be worth 50 or 70,000 words? Uh, fu funny you mention that. Actually, there is something that I've been working on kind of every now and again, a couple of hours a week in the background for about the last 12 months. Aha! <laughs> Well, as, as Hemingway said, the secret of writing is the application of the arse to the chair. <laughs> Come That's on, fire up. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. When I was an interviewer, we asked him quicker than that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, is, is there something, is there a particular um, maybe movie or something like that that sticks out in your mind that you would love to tackle? I have a lot of favorite films uh, that have moved me in, in particular ways. The, the the thing that stops the process is not just my love of the film, but whether there's enough information out there or enough people still alive to be able to reconstruct how it was made, the impact that it had, and to find out the details about it. And regrettably, so many people have died from the era that produced the films that raised me that it's going to be impossible to go there. Although the Market Herrick Library of the Motion Picture Academy out here has a phenomenal collection going all the way back to, I guess, really from the very beginning of clippings they've assembled from newspapers and magazines. And they, they have these elves back there that, that, that clip everything and save it. But that stopped when the American motion picture trade publications ceased covering movies as a process and just started being publicity for them. So it's really going to be impossible to write about movies made in the last 15 or 20 years by finding out all the details, unless you can speak to the people who are still alive from them. So uh, we're in kind of a transitional period now as far as film scholarship goes. And I have not yet found a film that I would like to spend 50,000 words in one year writing about. And, uh, you know, you mentioned um, 50,000 words, 70,000 words. Uh, could you describe maybe in layman's terms your writing process? Like, do you have any specific routines or habits to uh, keep yourself productive and creative? I find I get a lot of questions when people find out maybe somebody in particular is going to be on a show about uh, things like burnout or just getting completely overwhelmed by a project to the point where it maybe takes the life out of it. That's a very good question, and it's a, a deep psychological question. Having worked in radio, television, and newspapers for now to 20, 25 years, I became familiar with deadlines. And there's nothing that will stop you from writing something if it has to be due at a certain point. Uh, sort of like a student, knowing that a, a, a term paper is due in class, even if you do it the night before, the deadline still looms and serves as the appropriate pressure. In my case, if I'm doing something, I try to write a timeline first, whether it's a biography or the production of a motion picture. I'll do it from the time when the idea was first suggested by some author to the date of release of the film. And by doing this, I can then place all of the research along a particular date. That gives me a continuity so that I can actually follow the development of the product that I'm writing about. And then I start writing and making a narrative out of these factoids that I've kind of assembled, like a jigsaw puzzle. Eventually, the total picture becomes clear. And when there are still pieces missing, that's where I have to go and find interviews, where I have to do more research so that I can expand on the things that are of interest but are also obscure. So it's a long process, and it's not a linear process, even though I have a timeline you're still going out as if somebody threw all the puzzles of the jigsaw puzzle in the air and you have to find them scattered all over the room. You still know where they belong, but you have to find them. And that's the process I use. I hope that isn't too vague or too general to answer your question. No, that, that, uh, that makes sense. And it kind of ties into something else I wanted to ask about, you know, 
a lot of your work obviously involves like extensive research, interviews, things like that. Um, your approach then to gathering that information, um, how difficult has that been, you know, with the advent of, uh, I guess, how accessible things seem in one way with the internet and, and different things like that? Or does it even really tie into it? I feel like there's a lot of waffle online. <sighs> yes. If something's online, I mean, somebody else did it first. And if you're going to do original research, you can use that as reference. But in many cases, I mean, if it's a date of something, you're probably okay. But if it's somebody's feeling or somebody's analysis, you have to get to that person, not the person who wrote about that person. Uh, so, for example, when I was writing the biography of Arthur Penn, who very famously directed Bonnie and Clyde, Little Big Man, and other great films, uh, there was not a lot written about him. And what there was seemed to be recycled. So fortunately, he was still alive, and I was able to have him fill in all the blanks, and we developed a close relationship. Uh, but other people that I'm writing about, you know, they, they may be gone, they may not be available. Right now, the book I'm doing, I'm having trouble getting to people who are very, very important. So I'm getting to other people, and I hope that I can have an aggregate of people who bestow legitimacy on the project, that when I finally do get to the people above the line, the stars or directors, I'll have the... Uh, say, well, I've spoken to these people. Why don't you speak to me too? The other thing is kind of nasty, but I've used it on occasion. I, I tell people who may be resistant, I said, look, if you don't tell me when you're dead, somebody else is going to write about you and it's not going to be accurate. That's a fair point. Sometimes it works. Yeah. That's a fair point. Um, so how, uh, how big of an aspect would you say that is to... Um when you're reaching out to said people and maybe you get a no or you don't get an answer, or you're finding it hard to track somebody down. Um, how important is, I guess, networking, building relationships for, you know, it mightn't, it mightn't serve you right now, maybe in another project, somebody knows somebody and it ends up being a, a thing. Is that a, is that a huge part of what you do? Networking is very important when you're writing a book. And I've been fortunate to find out that writers, writers of other books, rather than be competitors, are actually quite helpful. We help each other wherever possible to connect each other with people we have to speak to. I don't know how it happens. I guess it's just something writers do and other professions perhaps don't. Um, the people I found least responsive are the agents and managers. And I can understand that. It's because they're supposed to get a percentage of what their client earns. And a free interview doesn't give them any, any money at all. But still, you know, it's, it's important that people take you seriously, which is why having a book that's successful or having some credibility as a writer is quite often an entree into being taken seriously and having your request for an interview forwarded. But you're right. It's, it's sometimes very hard to get people. And sometimes you simply can't get to people or they come to you after the book is out. They say, why didn't you talk to me? And I said, I tried half a dozen times and your people didn't send on the message. And sometimes that that has an effect. There's always a second edition. But that's a real problem that people won't talk to you. If it's just, you know, we had a good day shooting, it was fun. That's one thing. But if it's something substantive, you really have to talk to that person. Or guard yourself lawyer-wise so that you can't be sued for something you said that you didn't have complete information for. Do you have a, a, a project or a book that you've worked on that you would consider uh, a favorite of yours and one that sticks out in your mind, whether it be the finished product or... Uh, maybe the experience of writing it. I know that's probably like asking somebody to pick between their kids. But... It's true, you're right. <laughs> well, the one that means a lot to me, there are actually two, but the one that currently means a lot to me is called Big Bad John. And it's the colloquy I had with writer-director John Milius. Um, John has been a friend of mine for 50 years. And we're politically as polar as you can get, as opposite as can be. And yet we're friends because we believe in the same core issues, which is honor and decency and, and professionalism. I was speaking with John since 1973 when I was his publicist for his first film as a director, Dillinger. And we simply morphed through various stages and kept in touch. In fact, I, I uh, visited him a couple of weeks ago and spoke with him uh, sort of. Uh, about two weeks ago. He had a stroke in 2010, which robbed him of speech, but he's all there. He just has trouble expressing himself, but we've been in touch all this time. And this book is my tribute to the man we call the Yeti. He's abominable snowman, but John is hardly abominable. And the other book that I'm very fond of is called Sterling Siliphant, The Fingers of God. 
Sterling was the incredibly prolific screenwriter of the Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno and uh, hundreds and hundreds of scripts, including many for the 60s television series Route 66. He and I became friends when I was his publicist on The Towering Inferno. Then his widow, Tiana, who's an award-winning filmmaker, and I have been in touch over the years. And we put together a, a biography of Sterling. It's very rare to have a biography of a writer that they didn't write themselves. And that was brought out from Bear Manor Media. So I've been lucky to write a couple of books that mean a lot to me because they were about friends. And was this something that you always had a passion for? Like uh, you, you mentioned a few times about being a publicist and that's kind of um, maybe where you first became exposed to some of these people and some of the industry. But was this always something that was like in the back of your mind? I'd always wanted to be in movies ever since I wasn't chosen to learn how to run the movie projector when I was in fourth grade. I kind of made up for it on my own. You know, these... Funny how traumas, I mean, I didn't have a sled named Rosebud or anything. I had a projector named RCA. But I just wanted to do something with the movies. And when I gave up all hope of ever directing, because I have a big mouth, I decided to be a writer. And being a publicist was the best way into the industry because it enabled me to deal with people for short periods of time and be automatically trusted, which is the strangest thing about being a publicist. I mean, imagine being a world-famous movie star. Uh, I mean, Michael Caine or Paul Newman or somebody younger, they step off the airplane in a city they're not familiar with. A total stranger comes up to them and says, hello, Mr. Caine, I'm going to be in charge of your life for the next three days. You've got to trust me. That's a kind of a relationship you really don't have if you're meeting somebody on the street or in a club. And so we had a good three-day press tour, but I kept the relationship. And if I ever have to call Mr. Kane or sorry, Sir Michael for anything, maybe he'll pick up the call. I'm not saying we were friends, but I'm saying there's a, a little snippet of trust that's there. And a lot of the films that I, a lot of the books I've written began when I met these people as publicists. And so they didn't think I was just some reporter. They knew that we had worked together in the past and that was very helpful. And for you then, uh, at what point was that switch where you decided like, uh, you know, I have this idea, I want to turn this into um, something that's timeless because I feel like now uh, print and like a physical book is becoming um, just as important now. Like I, I, we've seen like the, the vinyl resurgence over the last couple of years. I know cassette had kind of done its thing again. And I feel like books are really making like a, a fast and hard comeback in a lot of ways. Um, I know for a time there are Kindles and things like that were kind of taken over but i see more and more books and i see more and more bookstores and and secondhand bookstores and people seem to have more books now and especially when they're put together like some of your work and it really feels like um it's it doesn't feel like a mass produced uh you know s soft cover book that's just like put out for the sake of it they really feel like a quality it's like a collector's piece as well as being full of information. From your mouth to God's ears, I wish there were more books. Perhaps your side of the pond is more literate than my side of the pond. It is. But the, the advent of print-on-demand and even self-publishing, well, less self-publishing because any arsehole can get something out. But print-on-demand is a way of keeping books in print without having to do a 5,000 or 10,000 book run which is Bear Matter Media's philosophy. Their business model is if, if they buy a book, they'll print a book when it's ordered. And so they don't have to pay a lot for inventory. And this is one way, although the quality of the books, unfortunately, they're not on archival paper and it's using a xerographic process rather than letterpress or offset. But it's still nice to have it out there. And if people like the book, they can keep it. Uh, versus the Kindle or the eBooks, which are, in my mind, ephemeral, but it's still nice to have them. They're a lot easier to do word searches in, I'll tell you that, than relying on indexes. You know, as long as people keep on reading and writing, there's still more books printed now than ever before in human history. So somebody's doing something and they're going somewhere. Um, for you, this is a kind of a, a selfish question, I guess, but I'm sure there's probably people that are gonna to listen to this that will have a similar, um, maybe a question or an idea. Uh, Let's just say I'm somebody who's working on something that I would love to. I don't I don't even really think uh, 
of it from a, a monetary perspective, a financial perspective, anything like that. But I would just love to see this thing that I put several years into out there. What advice would you give to somebody like that for attempting to do that? First, finish it. Most people don't. It's the same as people working on master's or doctoral theses in higher education. They don't finish. First thing is to finish. The second thing is to find someone else who likes the book. Show it to a friend. Have them proofread it and see if there's any interest. You don't want to send a version of your own personal loving book out there into the marketplace if it can't be received by somebody who understands what you were doing. That's just the mechanics of the aesthetics. The business part of it is you have to find a publisher if you're working with a completed book. If it's your first book, the first manuscript has to be on spec because nobody's going to give money in advance to somebody who just has written a proposal and has no track record otherwise. You have to find a publisher. And in America, there is a book called Publisher's Marketplace or um, Writer's Market. I don't know what there might be in the UK. There may be a, a, a corresponding book. The UK has some marvelous publishers. So you simply send a query letter to them, a letter saying, dear so-and-so, here's what I've written. Would you be interested in seeing it? It's a completed manuscript. And unlike film companies and television companies, the people who run publishing houses tend to be open to submissions, even if it's over the transom, as they say, because that's how they discover manuscripts. But send the query letter first and then see if they're interested. And for God's sake, don't send your only copy after that. Although most people, I think, now request a submission online. But send a PDF and not a Word document because you don't want them changing it. That's all I can suggest is finish the damn work first and then see if anybody's interested in reading it. Uh, is there, so in that situation, I don't know if this is something that's a actually real or it's the, the usual like online conspiracy theory thing. Uh, the idea of, you know, I, you're probably in a completely different position now, but let's say you're in that position and maybe you have worked on something and, and you do exactly that. Is there ever a fear of um, having your work ripped off or, you know, you send some of this stuff to somewhere and they turn it down, let's say, and then all of a sudden it turns up elsewhere, but you have no real proven track record. I mean, right. As, as it stands now, I, I can't imagine that uh, anybody would be able to get away with maybe doing that to you at your current stage in your career. But, you know, let's say go way, way back. Is that a possibility for people to get? Because I feel like I hear that excuse used a lot. It's surprisingly rare to have one's work stolen from one. And that's very simply because it's so much easier to buy it cheap than it is to risk being sued for having stolen it. I don't know what copyright is like in the United Kingdom. It's, it's different than it is in the United States. But copyright vests with the person who created the work. It's automatic. The statutory part, the damages and others come in when one registers one's work with the appropriate copyright authority. Here, it's the United States Copyright Office. I don't know what it's like in other countries. But we're all they're all signatures of the Berne Convention of Copyright. But honestly speaking, it's very rare to have something stolen as long as you keep a paper trail you know, keep all the letters, print out the emails if necessary, and write down any notes that you have had when you've been on a telephone call with someone. That's going to serve as evidence if anybody steals from you. But even if, if somebody does steal from you, well, what did Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger write in The Red Shoes? It is more depressing to have to steal than to be stolen from. Just keep records of everything. That's a, that, that's a fair point. Uh... Because I feel like that that comes up, man. Maybe not just with uh, with um, books or things like that, but I've I've definitely heard that excuse used before, and I don't know if it's a case of maybe fear of the unknown or putting it out into the world, and then it ends up being a flop or seen as a failure. So people just use the excuse of like, oh, I've got to keep this close to me because somebody's gonna steal it away. Um, well, that would be sort of self complimentary. This is too good for anybody else to see. Look, I moved out to California thirty years ago. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's really 30. Uh, I, I had sold a, uh, a story idea to a very popular television series. A friend of mine was one of the showrunners on it. And I moved out, all set to go. And he said, Nat, we had 26 slots for next season. And yours was a 27th story that we bought. I'm sorry, but the sale is off. And I was really depressed until I watched the next season. And they had used my story on the series. 
I had no recourse because they changed it just enough. But it was my first lesson, and it's a lesson that I never forgot. Is that you can trust people, but sometimes stuff happens. Uh, you'll, you'll never meet anybody who hasn't been ripped off at least once in this industry. As far as books, though, it's very rare because it just takes a lot of effort to write a book, much more so than having a staff do a television program. And so you'll find that books are very, very unusual to have them stolen. That was something I was going to ask about um, overcoming, uh, whether it be a situation like that, or maybe just having a, a little bit of a downturn in life or in creativity or how productive you, you are. Uh, is there anything that you do, I guess, to keep yourself grounded and, and your head above water that you don't let that kind of thing completely, uh, I guess, I don't want to say ruin your career, but, you know, to, to completely spiral downwards and let everything get on top. No, I've been eating lunch on that story for 30 years, so I don't mind at all. I usually name the guy. This is different. You have to simply have a schedule to do something. If, if you, I usually say that if I wake up every morning and I get out of bed and I go to the bathroom in that order, I'm fine. You have to have a schedule to do everything. And if it's sitting at the typewriter doing nothing for an hour, at least you get your body physically used to being there for that amount of time. And eventually ideas happen. I think John Cleese wrote about this too, about setting a time for doing something and you get used to it. Well, it's very helpful for also for putting your frame of mind correctly, that you can't be bothered with what other people are doing. We all have exigencies that will stop us or depress us. And believe me, I am not rich. I'm, I'm living royalty check to royalty check. But at least I've got royalties coming in and it's taken 30 years to get to that point. I hope other people have their success sooner. And I'm not even a success. Trust me, our internal revenue service, our tax man is going to make sure that I'm not a success. But you simply live day by day. Oh, I, I sound like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take every day as it comes. The alternate is worse. Yeah, that that's true. Um <laughs> <laughs> that threw me off there completely. Um, I can't we talked about my book. <laughs> Look, let, let's talk about the second book. Do you mind? I'm trying to sell copies here. <laughs> I, uh, I can't remember what I was going to say now. I'm giving um, you a hard time, Aaron. I'm sorry. I feel very loose and very happy to be talking to you. It's um, it's just fascinating to talk to because I, I feel like uh, these are the stories maybe that um, – people probably need to hear because I think there's a little bit of an illusion that, um, you know, and, and I probably had a, a similar illusion and not to take anything away from you, but, you know, I, I look at your work. Um, I already have some of your previous work. I just got this, um, the new book, The Exorcist book. And I think there's a little bit of an illusion of, um, you know, th this person is living on this golden pedestal and doesn't have to deal with any like anything that anybody else deals with obviously it's so easy to get a book made now and it's so easy to write a book and it's so easy to like cash the check and everything and then to hear the the real life version of that it's quite refreshing i think and maybe helps people realize okay you know i i have some real life shit going on but i can i can overcome it and keep it moving <laughs> It does sound like something the, the parson would say, but, you know, you have to get up every morning and do things. Otherwise, you're just a lump on a log. And this doesn't apply just to writers. It applies to anybody who's doing anything. As Woody Allen says, 90 percent of life is just showing up. Yeah, true. Is there is there anything you do to keep the creativity and things like that flowing? Like, do you consume um, a lot of media in any way? Only when it relates to what I'm doing will I consume media or related subjects. I found that the, the most helpful thing to my productivity is that I stopped drinking about a year and a half ago. And I've been writing seven books. I, I, I don't make the connection because I really like bourbon whiskey. But uh, if I can you know get paid to not drink, I'm happy to do it. Uh, that's really it. I mean... Plus COVID, I hate to say this, and sequestering was very helpful to me because even though publishers weren't doing things during COVID lockdown, I was, which is why I seem to have these books coming out one by one. Uh, in fact, they've taken a long time to write, but they're all coming out all bunched together now. It's just a, a, a trick of time, I suppose. 
the only thing I can say is in writing or any kind of creativity as in life, you have to have experiences and you have to be able to translate them so that other people can understand them. Whether you're telling a joke at a party or giving a sermon or writing a book, uh, we are humans. We communicate. We have the blessing of articulate speech and written language. We're the only creature on the face of the earth that can communicate from one generation to the next, even if we're not there because we have the legacy of writing. And I think we should abuse that. I think we should you know, forget about 20 second on TikTok and, and talk about writing letters to each other again and expressing ourselves. Uh, and as regards um, the Exorcist legacy, w what are some things that um, are, people are going to experience inside the book that maybe they might not expect? Because I think um, for maybe the the mainstream or the, the average person that looks at it, they'll just probably think, oh, it's just a book about the Exorcist movie, which... Uh, I would rather you say it in your own words because I don't think I'll do it justice, but I feel like it's so much more than that. <laughs> well, it, it is to me, of course. Uh, but the, the, the funny, I, I never read reviews because having been a critic for years, I, I don't trust critics. But the two comments that I've heard most frequently about the book that baffle me are, one, there's more in it about The Exorcist films than you'd ever want to know. And there's so much in it about The Exorcist films that you already know. So I'm trying to reconcile those two. I think for fans of The Exorcist, they're still going to find things they never thought about before. And for people who are coming to it new, and there's millions of people who've been too afraid to see the movie over the years, or who have for some reason put it off, they will find tons of spoilers and also explaining some of the questions they may have. Because it isn't about just how the movies were made. We also talk about the ritual of exorcism, the history of exorcism within the Catholic Church. We talk about the existence of Satan over the years and which various religions will use to define Satan. We talk about Satan's position in folklore around the world. I have a wonderful uh, Irish writer named Michael Scott, who was my source on folklore. Who, uh, he's not a bad source either, you know, writing the books on the Nicholas Flamel series. And so I have a lot of people who are contributing as well as the history of the various films, not just the original 1973 Exorcist, but the other ones that came after it. And so it's a comprehensive look at all of the films. I, I use the plural exercise. And I think we'll let people know that there's more than just a little bit about a girl who was possessed when they watch these films. They're real cultural barometers. Was it important to you to include uh, more than just the original? Oh, sure, because there's a whole franchise now. Franchise is this awful word that means we keep on knocking them out like widgets. In fact, the new films that are coming out from David Gordon Green, the first one is called The Exorcist Believer, is coming out in late October here in the States. I don't know where it is otherwise. Is a reboot of the original film with Ellen Burstyn in it. There are also two more sequels to that film which are coming out over the next year or two so it's very much alive and even though William Peter Blatty did not write the original Exorcist in 1971 as a franchise the success of the first film made Warner Brothers consider it a franchise when they made the second one and then they sold the rights with Blatty's permission to Morgan Creek Productions and they definitely considered it a franchise and have produced or co-produced all the subsequent Exorcist films and so it's become literally like this growing ball of of exorcisms that has been haunting us for the last 50 years and continues to do so it's a uh, it, it is wild to think because uh, i i normally travel to orlando every september for universal's halloween horror nights where they do their like haunted mazes and stuff i had the chance to do the original exorcist maze they done and um, then they brought it back several years later uh, for their 25th anniversary and this year i'm actually going in uh, two weeks time and they have an exorcist believer uh, haunted house to tie in with the the new movie how much did did you get a chance to talk to that team uh, have you seen the movie do you know like what the story follows or, or how much of that have you i guess dove into my deadline was a year and a half ago and so i haven't seen a particle of the film but david gordon green was gracious enough to do an email interview with me and i specify that because he wasn't supposed to talk about the film with anybody but he did with me on the assurance that I would listen to him. And I asked him some general questions, not specifics about how he was going to make the movie. But I did want to have him 
tell me something about why he did it and what was in his mind. So I haven't seen the film yet. I've seen the trailers, but I haven't seen the film and I'm reserving any judgment on it. I hope it's good because Ellen Burstyn is in it and she's no fool. You know, Ellen gave me an interview again before all the other interviews came out. And she told me why she did the movie, which was first, she trusted the filmmaker. But secondly, she held them up for so much money that she got paid an incredible payday. And she gave all of this money to set up a scholarship fund at the Actors Studio, a master's degree program for future actors. So Ellen Burstyn, in a sense, sold her artistic soul, if you will. But she did it to benefit the next generation of actors. And I think that's exactly what the notion of sacrifice in The Exorcist is all about. So I'm proud of her. I think she's our finest American actress, and I'm looking forward to seeing her work in the film. Uh, do, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I want to say it is, but do you cover the TV series? Yes, I covered the TV series. The TV series went on for two seasons, 10 episodes each with Gina Davis. I spoke to the showrunner of the television series, and he was not terribly happy with the way it turned out. But I think it was extraordinary to take a simple thing like a possession story and stretch it for two years. But the secret of the television series, which is available on disc to various places, is that it was a demimond, if you will. It was caught between the end of broadcast television and the beginning of cable and streaming television. So they had to clean it up because it was on the air broadcast. We have standards and practices here. Uh, and they couldn't be as free as they would have been if it had been on, on uh, cable or, uh, or private. And so it's a, kind of a sad case. At the same time, it's beautifully produced. And the acting is just phenomenal. And the writing is, is very, very good. So I think it was a bit overlooked because of what it had to be. Had they been able to go balls out on the whole thing, I thought it would have been a real classic. Yeah, it, it's a little bit unfortunate. And time and time again, within uh, obviously the, the horror community and and things like that, um, that I kind of run in, that's always seen as, uh, it always gets really good feedback even now. And like people are always, you know, they always talk about, I can't, you know, I can't believe it got cancelled after two seasons. I wish we had been able to see more. It's it's such a pity. Yeah. Um, it, it's well, unfortunate. You're right, but but you'll, you'll find out from um, Jeremy Slater, who was the showrunner and the, and the co-creator of it, exactly what happened. It's heartrending. He was a terrific guy. He, was, he didn't care who heard what he was telling me. And it's very, very forthcoming to find out what happened to the actual series. Much more than you'll pick up at a comic book convention, I promise you. Is that um, is that something that happens often? Uh, like in your personal experience, when you talk to people, do you ever find that people are maybe potentially sent censoring themselves for fear of repercussion with maybe future works or things like that? That's a you're reading my mind. I had that happen when I interviewed William Peter Blatty. I went to the house where he was living in in Connecticut years ago when I was doing the biography of William Friedkin. So this would have been eighty eight, eighty nine. And we had a, well, we, we kept in touch anyway, and we became friends, but we had a very, very frank discussion. And I sent him a transcript of the interview for his corrections, which, by the way, I now have a hand-corrected copy of an original William Peter Blatty manuscript, which is pretty good. Uh, and he, he crossed out a lot of what we had talked about because he thought it was a little bit too revealing at the time. And he wrote on the side, you can't use this, Nat. I have enough troubles. Which I thought was very sweet. But of course, now I put it in the Exorcist book because Bill passed in 2017 and all bets are off. And I guess aside from that, is that, is that something maybe not even through your experience, but does that happen? Like, does that happen often? Is that is that something like, I feel like nowadays uh, things like cancel culture um, and people just maybe wait to jump on a, a story or a, uh, something like that, a quote, you'll have TMZ and all these people that will cover things that they never cover just because. Um, is that a thing that happens? Do you, can you, uh, I guess, can you sense the bullshit if somebody's maybe given you a, a different version of what you may believe to be the truth? Yes, this happens sometimes. You could read body language or you can hear inflections of a voice so that you wonder if anybody is really giving you the truth. But then what happens is when you go checking on the story with other people who were there or just people who talk about the results of what the person had quote unquote lied about, you then have the choice of either calling this person a liar in print or, and I find this more useful, simply printing all the other versions of the story 
And it isn't that you let the reader decide. What you do is use certain words and let them know whose side you're on. For example, if you say, blah, 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 said this, that's one thing. But if you say, blah, 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 claimed this, it's a shaded word that gives the reader the understanding that you don't think the person was blah, blah, blahing accurately. It's all in the assembly. It's all which quote comes when and which version of the story you go by. I mean, sometimes there are a Rashomon, a legitimate different point of view of the stories that you're telling. For example, the car chase in the French Connection. I have three different people saying three different scenes, and they were all in the car. Things happen. But as far as willful lying, that's very rare because people know when they see something in print, it's going to follow them around forever. But I have had that happen, and I have corrected it. Do you get uh, approached now to uh, by people maybe to have a, a story or a movie or anything like that covered? Is that something where, I don't know, people pitch to you, maybe they like your work, like your style, and they want you to do something? Surprisingly, no. I say surprisingly because my agent asked the same question. I'd love to get calls from the big magazines to say, here, Nat, here's $5,000. Give us a thousand words on something. But that hasn't happened. When people die, I mean, when, when Billy died a couple of weeks ago, Billy Friedkin, I got a call from exactly one reporter for a comment. And my book has been out for 33 years. I'm his biographer. No calls from anybody in the press. I think what's happened is we're in a new generation where if it isn't online, nobody thinks it's real. Nobody does deep research anymore, except for people who write books. There are some wonderful biographers and researchers out there, too many to name here, who know what they're doing and who go through everything from birth certificates to death certificates and everything in between. They do their job. We all try to do biographies and books that cover everything. But unfortunately, the popular media seldom has the time to do that. And the popular media are what dominate our thinking now. It, yeah, it's kind of strange considering that anybody can put anything online technically. You can edit a Wikipedia and put whatever you want in. You can kind of do whatever, but we take that as like the gospel. Whatever you read online is obviously true. <sighs> That's the problem. That's... Uh... Not only the problem in, in the arts or any kind of coverage, but in America right now, that's, that's the trouble with politics. That anybody can put anything online and it has some veracity, even if it's false. Uh, are you, a, well, I would assume you are, but do you, do you watch many movies now or TV shows or things like that? I haven't lately. I haven't watched a lot lately because I've been writing books. Uh, also, I'm, I, I'm 74, okay, and I'm out of the demographic target audience for most films that are made today. I suppose I'll see Barbie or Oppenheimer at some point, but I really have no desire to go out to movies. I'm too busy being here with my dog writing books, which is fortunate because I'm not writing reviews anymore. I'm not writing them a contemporary cinema, but I will see things. I will watch them online or DVD, and it is the theatrical experience. But look, for four years, I worked in my college cinema. I was a publicist working with theaters for five years. I had to go to the movies three times a week and, and it, work there. Then I was a critic and I must have seen who knows how many thousands of films. So for 30 years, I was going to the movies a couple of times a week. I kind of burned out on the theatrical experience. And I'm just as happy to put on YouTube now and see what's coming on. Is there a, do you have any, I guess, comfort movies? Is there anything that maybe you'd stick on in the background for either inspiration to unwind or something that you would revisit over and over again, whether it be a movie, piece of music, something like that? This is going to sound like I'm pandering to you, but every St. Patrick's Day, I watch The Quiet Man. Nice. That's a good choice. <laughs> I have to. I have to um, for any number of reasons. In fact, there's a director named Kevin Connor, who surprisingly is Irish, who's been trying for years to make a film called Connemara Days, which is a behind the scenes drama about what it was like to film The Quiet Man. He's been trying to raise money for a long time. Uh, I, I hope. He can before we all go away. That's one comfort movie. And, you know, things like His Girl Friday, I love, or um, uh, uh, I'm going up on it here, uh, uh, My Man Godfrey. I mean, 30 screwball comedies or even early 40 screwball comedies because of the wit involved. We're not talking fast cutting or cinema. We're talking in His Girl Friday, watching Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell in a two shot at eye level that Howard Hawks said, OK, action. And they talk for about seven minutes, and it's the funniest thing there is. That's, to me, much better than multiple cuts and, you know, three-frame 
entry cuts and, and, and what's happening today. And they're funny. It's performance as well as material. So I tend to like the old movies, not for nostalgia's sake, but because they work. Is The Exorcist the scariest movie ever made? Not to me. Uh, to me, the scariest movie ever made is what Michael Moore produces. Uh, Fahrenheit, <laughs> Fahrenheit 911 and, you know, whatever comes out about Trump is going to be the scariest movie I've ever seen because it's real. Uh, the Exorcist is scary to some people, but it didn't scare me because I read the book. But secondly, I saw the tricks. I mean, I knew what was going on. But yes, it is very scary. And the way I describe how scary it is, is that if you are seeing a horror movie in the cinema, you know, you've got the Frankenstein monster, you've got Freddy Krueger, you've got Jason Voorhees, you've got Dracula or, or the mummy. When you leave the cinema, th those guys are still in there on the screen. But when you get home, Satan could be waiting for you in the hall closet. And that's what makes the extras just scary to many people. It's 2,000 years of brainwashing by organized religion to tell them that the devil's real and he's going to be after you. That's scary. Do you think that's... Um the like of that is what's carried this on for so long, like to be to be having this conversation now 50 years later and it's a, as popular. And like you said, we have a new trilogy coming. It's going to be huge come October. I'm sure we're going to see Exorcist Believer literally everywhere. You've got your book. Uh, it's been super well received. Uh, the the hard community has gone wild for it. Uh, is that the reason? The Exorcist is powerful cinema. We explain in the book about the reality and about how it was done in documentary style and all that. But it's, it's powerful because it recalls so many things from our own souls, our own belief systems. And plus, it's not just a horror movie, which I don't think it is. I, I agree with the Bills that it's a film about the a, a supernatural detective story. But there are four basic stories of The Exorcist that compel people to watch. First and foremost, it's the story about a mother who's trying to protect her child. Everybody can relate to that. Secondly, it's the story about a murder of a detective, a, a film director, Burke Dennings, and how a detective is trying to find out. It's also the story about a priest who's lost his faith and regains his faith at the last moment by doing the, the holiest thing that a human can possibly do. He gives up his life. He sacrifices his life to save the life of somebody he has never met. And then, of course, it's the story about an old exorcist who comes face to face with an old enemy of his. These are four human stories that are wrapped up in a movie about a little girl whose head turns around. It's an extraordinarily well-constructed story, and the film delivers that. So what's, uh, you know, moving on from this now again, like you said, this is, this has been seen as a, as a hit and I think it's only going to grow on that. What's, what's next for you within the next 18 to 24 months? I'm writing a book now on a contract about a film franchise here in America and around the world that fascinates me because so many people hate it. I don't hate it. And I'm writing about why it's important and why it's a cultural barometer, if you will. Uh, and the other book, I just started last night. I want to see how far I get with it. I, I can't even describe it because I don't yet know what it is. But it's generally a, a book about what scared you when you were little. And I want to see if it still scares adults. But I don't know. I've, I've somehow become identified with the horror genre. And I'm not a horror expert. Just as I became identified with the science fiction genre. And I'm not a science fiction expert. And when I did the biography of Stan Lee for television, I became identified with the comic books. And I'm not a comic book expert. So maybe I should find something that I am an expert in and write a book about it. I mean, you've done a pretty good job. Um, I, I have a couple of final questions before I let you go. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you started this, this new book last night and you don't really know exactly what it is yet. Um, when you have, uh, you know, maybe the itch to, to start working on a new project, is it something where you will try to inspire yourself by, you know, whether it's taking a walk, uh, listening to something, music, watch a movie, or is it just something that happens naturally? Maybe you'll see something, have a conversation, and it just sparks that, that idea. Well, as they say, ideas are like hemorrhoids. Sooner or later, every arsehole gets one. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I hope this language works, by the way, for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, if I can't get an idea out of my head for a couple of days, and if I start writing notes about it, 
to me, that compels me to sit at the computer and start typing. And if I've done a couple of thousand words and I'm just writing in circles or, you know, going nowhere, I discard it. But I know it's always there somewhere in the computer. Uh, I, I would say this is fatuous, but during COVID, <laughs> don't tell my publisher, I went through my computer and looked at all the ideas that hadn't gotten very far. And I found a couple that actually were pretty good. And because of being sequestered during COVID, I started writing them and I sold one. So never throw anything away. What, what, what did David Mamet say? A good writer is someone who keeps what other people throw away. But a good writer is also someone who throws away what other people keep. Solid advice. Um, so, you know, going forward, you, you've got all these projects going. Uh, what would you, and I don't want this to sound... Um, how would I say it? Cringy, I guess, for want of a better word. But what what do you want your your legacy to be with this, or or what? Um, because I feel like what you're doing in the medium you've chosen is gonna be timeless, much more than I think a lot of people feel. Like, oh, you know, the internet, we can put videos out, we can we we can record audio like this, we can do things like that. But I feel like something, a tangible thing like a book, it's just it's a piece of history that can never be um, erased. But for you personally, you know, what is it that you want to, I guess, leave behind in a hundred years when it's all said and done? <laughs> I haven't really thought about this because doing so means that I'm expecting the end to come. This, by the way, is why it's so hard to get people to sit down for interviews for biographies, because they think if they tell you something, they're going to pop off the next day. I guess in my case, what I like to see is a large, royalty check that's written paid to the order of my heirs. I want to leave something behind other than a greasy spot. That's a real answer. That is a real answer. Um, I, I guess then to wrap up, uh, you know, where can people follow you, keep up with you and um, maybe a piece of advice that you would give to not necessarily writers or authors, but maybe someone struggling with their creative endeavors, um, having a little bit of a hard time or a downturn. They can keep up with me by looking at my website, www.natsegaloff.com. I try to update it whenever I can. Uh, it's also a sales site, let's face it. I have it up there so people know I'm legitimate. As far as people who may be struggling with their creativity, you're not alone. But creativity is a very lonely thing to do. All I can say is don't give up. Well, that sounds terrible, but just keep, keep writing, keep carving, keep sculpting, keep creating. You never know when something is going to work out for you. If, if you must create, then you must create. There's no way around that. Don't let anybody tell you not to create. Just, you may have to find a proper time and place for it. But there's so little creativity in the world and there's so much evil in the world that keeps you from being creative. Whether you're young or old, don't let anybody tell you that it can't be done, except perhaps for building fragmentation bombs. <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, this has been like a, uh, I guess, a, a learning lesson for me as well. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people that will listen to this that will attest to that. Uh, like I said, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, I've... I followed your work for a long time and then this kind of the exorcist book coming out really sealed the deal for me. I was like, this was a, a, a godsend. I don't know if you could call it that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, well, it's been an honor. It's been an honor to chat. Aaron, thank you so much for these incisive questions and also for sharing part of your life with me. Uh, this was originally a half hour interview. So unless you're going to start editing it, it's gone on far longer. And I found it very satisfying. I hope it is for you and your viewers too. Yes, likewise. And uh, hopefully we can do it again in the future because um, the way you're putting together material, I feel like we will probably <laughs> have a lot to talk about in 12 to 18 months. I think we will. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.